Uh, the Met thinks I'm bringing um, some comedy, but actually uh, I feel like the, everything has been pretty lowbrow thus far with the Nobel Prize winners and the MacArthur Genius Grants. So I'm here to do the heavy intellectual lifting for you guys. <laughs> Buckle up, I'm going to make you much smarter by the end of this. Okay. Um, now, uh, I used to be black, um, and, and we're going to get to that in just a, in just a minute, but, uh, but to, to be honest with you, I'm actually an Iranian-American Muslim female, okay? I'm one of these hyphenated types of people or whatever, like one of you might be like some sort of Indo-Romanian Pentecostal or, or a Jamaican-Irish, which would make you particularly fun, right? <laughs> and, and when you're um, a hyphenated type person, you don't necessarily have icons that speak to you, that reflect who you are, right? And the problem with the icons that we do have is that they're very limiting, right? They define things, and those definitions stick. For example, when you think of the iconic dancer, you think of these ladies, right? You don't necessarily think of these ladies, who I believe... <laughs> I believe they're twerking. And you don't necessarily identify the iconic dancer with this kind of booty overload, right? Now, when you think of the iconic artist, you think of this dude. He's kind of homely. He's got a flock of seagulls haircut. Um, he's wearing a smock, right? But you don't necessarily think of this person, a stand-up comedian, right? <laughs> Additionally confusing, because this stand-up comedian has boobs. Very weird. Now, speaking of boobs, the iconic image of women from the beginning of time has been boobs and booty. Here's boobs and booty in the 18th century, boobs and booty in the 19th century, <laughs> boobs and booty in the 20th century, and this is boobs and booty in the 21st century. I want to add, this is a Nagin Farsad original. This is... <laughs> Yeah, thank you, thank you. It's, um, it's a felt tip pen on notepad, and um, it's been valuated at one million dollars by the Schmotherby's Schmockchen Schmouse. So that's just a little note for all you art collectors out there. We'll talk after the show. But if you think boobs and booty have had it rough, take a look at the oppressive iconography surrounding fruit. Fruit have been the prisoners of bowls. Since the beginning of time, look at fruit in a bowl, fruit in a bowl. I mean, look deep inside your heart into the racist most part of your soul and ask yourself, when have you thought of fruit outside of a bowl? You haven't, be honest. It goes as far back as the first century BC in this fresco. I learned that this is called a fresco. All right, now, uh, <laughs> I, thought, I said I was going to teach you some stuff, and here it is, guys. Um, a little-known artist uh, named Paul Cezanne, he tried to draw fruit outside of a bowl. And for this violation of fruit iconography, he was beheaded. Now, <laughs> art historians in the room will certainly tell you um, that this is a historical fact that I just made up. Now. The question becomes, okay, we get it, uh, so the icons can be limiting, but who cares? Does it really affect individuals, like, on an individual level? What does it matter? Well, I would say that, yes, I feel like it creates a lot, a lot of identity confusion, but don't take my word for it, guys. I'm going to let science do the work here by uh, referring to a case study I like to call the Nagin Farsad case study, a case study of Nagin Farsad by Nagin Farsad, including a sample set of one Nagin Farsad. Um, sample set size is very important in science, guys. Now, as I mentioned, I'm an Iranian-American Muslim female. I'm also a comedian. And like most comedians, I have a master's degree in African-American studies. <laughs> very typical. You've heard it before. Uh, now, the, 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 the makeup of the African-American studies program, uh, the purple represents <laughs> the black students. And uh, the, the, the blue wedge represented the singular uh, non-black student. Uh, now, the question is, how did I get here? Well, I got here because I felt black for a lot of my life. Um, sometimes I felt kind of black, sometimes I felt sort of black, other days it was Don Cheadle, and sometimes I was just hungry. You know what I mean? It's just a little hungry. But to really understand how I got to this point, let's go back to the very beginning, right, to where I grew up. I grew up in a town called Palm Springs, California, in the desert of Southern California. <laughs> what up, Palm Springs, anyone? All right. So it's, 
It's, uh, it's known for its uh, golf, its sizable retirement community, its huge gay community. Um, it's the kind of place where you'll find a lot of like Lady Gaga fans uh, adjusting their catheters. It's that kind of town. <laughs> Now, if you look at the makeup of Palm Springs, you'll note here the, the old people at 35%. There's a huge Mexican population. There are the gays, a, a friendly grouping of lesbians. Um, there are my parents and myself at 2.5%. That makes sense statistically. And, um, and this one dude, uh, uh, the smallest wedge there, we have a dude named Hassan Pat Ortiz Nighthawk Patel. He didn't fit into a category, so he gets his own wedge. Um, and uh, he was a bit of a loner, a bit of a loner. Now, as you can tell, from this chart, there weren't any black people in Palm Springs, right? Um, the, uh, and, and, and yet, uh, you know, I said that I grew up feeling pretty black. Um, and because the, the only black people uh, we had in Palm Springs uh, were Mexican. So I went with feeling Mexican while I was living there. Now, I know that some parts of this presentation might feel culturally insensitive to you, but that's okay because growing up, there was no such thing as cultural sensitivity, guys. <laughs> Yeah, it was a lot like today, so <laughs> very similar, very similar. Now, I, um, now it wasn't just that, like, they're, they're, you know, Mexicans, they had food everywhere, the ranchero music was ubiquitous, but what really sealed the, the deal was the names. When I went to school, I had a teacher who had no problem pronouncing the names of, uh, of all of the Mexican students. She would be like, Aurelia, here, Rodrigo, here, uh, and then it would get to me, Megan, no, Nagin, Mugreen, no, uh, Nagin, Noodle, and I swear to God, <laughs> this woman called me Noodle Farsad for an entire week. <laughs> There's some wounds, guys. I carry some wounds. And I long to be called Alejandra or Conchita or something, a name that they had a reference for. And I long to be Mexicans. Mexicans were so organized, right? And I wanted to be in a gang. I felt left out of the violence. And Mexicans, they had issues and really cool icons, icons like Cesar Chavez. I would walk around campus saying things like, man, we need to fight for workers' rights. And I did it in the voice of the Taco Bell Chihuahua. <laughs> Because like I said, there was no cultural sensitivity when I was growing up, as evidenced by the Taco Bell Chihuahua. <laughs> so I graduated from high school and ended up uh, going to college in upstate New York, uh, where there were no Mexicans, no Mexicans as far as the eye could see. There were more white people than I had ever seen in my entire life, however. <laughs> And I thought for a second, well, maybe I should do that. Maybe I should try being white. Maybe that's, that'll be my thing. Turns out there's far too much Dave Matthews involved in being white, so that was just, <laughs> as you've all seen, uh, that was just a non-starter for me. So I went with the next most iconic group on campus, and that was the black students. Uh, and that's when the black formation truly began. I started watching Spike Lee movies. I started quoting Frederick Douglass, a known James Brown impersonator. <laughs> I started wearing uh, my activism on my sleeve through such valiant acts as wearing this Malcolm X t-shirt on campus. Then I end up graduating, and I go uh, to the uh, Graduate Department of African American Studies at Columbia, where classmates would say to me, um, it's, why, it's, why are you here? Don't you uh, have your own people, or what's the deal? <laughs> And I would be like, I can't believe you're saying that. I, w I have the Medgar Evers biopic, director's cut in my bag. <laughs> I will stand and fight for African-American rights whenever and wherever. And they would say, yeah, it's weird that you would do that. <laughs> Can you stop doing that? And that's when I had to reckon with my own identity, right? To really recognize that I'm, it turns out, not Mexican or black, um, that I'm actually an Iranian-American Muslim female. The only problem with that was that the icons that were available to me were kind of lame. For example, this lovely lady with the delightful <laughs> eyeballs, right? 
uh, or these dudes who hang out uh, with AK-47s. You know the way Middle Eastern gentlemen do. They just hang out with AK-47s. <laughs> Or if you're Iranian, you might get the particular gift of being associated with uranium. <laughs> and so, it goes in nuclear weapons, guys. Okay, all right, it's fine. Um, now, I, uh, and the problem with these icons is that they didn't look like anyone. They didn't feel like me. They didn't represent me. They didn't look like any of the Iranians. I knew Iranians like this woman, my mother. Now. <laughs> I know to most of you, she looks like someone who's harboring nuclear weapons in her quote-unquote garden, but after much investigation, I found that the only thing she's really harboring is a very healthy stock of DiGiorno frozen pizzas in her freezer, um, though you'll never find a pepperoni pizza because she is a terrorist. <laughs> So now the question becomes, all right, we get it. You didn't have any icons growing up. It led to a Mexican and black phase. What are you going to do about it? Well, I decided I'm going to make new icons. So, for example, throughout my work, I have tried in, in stand-up and in filmmaking um, to do just that, to turn these things on their heads. Uh, on, and my most recent project is a film along with uh, Dino Bidala. I rounded up a bunch of Muslim American comedians in a nonviolent way. And <laughs> we... We went on the road um, to places like Alabama and Mississippi and Tennessee and Georgia and Arizona, places where they love the muzzies. <laughs> and, and we did a, we had a stand-up comedy tour, and the tour was called The Muslims Are Coming. <laughs> And that's also the title of the film that's now out. Now, uh, in, when we were in these cities, uh, we would ask people to come ask us questions, ask a Muslim a question. We would, come, uh, we would invite people to come bowl with a Muslim. Why can't this be an iconic image, a poorly bowling Muslim woman? Or why can't this be an iconic image, a bunch of Muslims stuffing their face with tacos? Or, or if you really want to turn the violent and terrorist um, icon Pornography on its head. What about some hardcore chest on chest hugging, as in this image? <laughs> Hug a Muslim, right? Now, this is, this, these are the, now I ask you guys to join me in building new icons. Maybe next time you present the classic American hamburger, it's with saffron. Or, or maybe next time you envision uh, the classic American town, it's with church steeples and minarets. Or maybe this ice cream flavors are, are instead of chocolate and vanilla, it's chocolate and turmeric, uh, which sounds a little gross. If we're honest, that does sound gross to me. Uh, but let's make, you know, mid curry falafel a thing. The possibilities are endless because we can't really have more Nagin Farsads from the case study of Nagin Farsad by Nagin Farsad of Nagin Farsad, a sample set of one Nagin Farsad, running around thinking that they're black or Mexican. It doesn't make sense. And we can't have any more Hassan Pat Ortiz Nighthawk Patels feeling so lonely. So guys, join me and let's bang out some new icons. Thank you. Thank you.